Um, so, Mikhail, were you gonna do an invite? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I can do it. I thought you were going to uh, do it, but uh, I'll do yeah. it. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're gonna do it, or I'm gonna do it. Uh, I'll do it. I've okay. got the an invite link. Nice. <clears throat> All right, I'll give it a couple more minutes and then just get going. Ah, I would guess that some people would hop in uh, seeing uh, the responses on your message, but uh... <laughs> ah, welcome. Welcome, Rob. Okay, um, am I, wait, oh, I said no screen, streaming, go live, uh oh, didn't work. Huh, weird. Is my screen showing anything? I just got the loading animation. Yeah. Same here. The stream currently has reduced video or audio quality. This may be due to network conditions. Let me reduce my quality, I guess. So I've never streamed on Discord before. Yeah, I don't know. 
I was going to say, I have seen people have success with completely restarting the application. I have no good reason why that should work, but that's always an option. So uh, I've just opened the Binance, and uh, that's a, a nice drop. <laughs> We're at uh, 3,600 now, uh, 3,660 for Ethereum, and 48,000 for Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah, supposedly it was the Tesla announcement that did it, but I get the energy and efficiency argument. Like, the Bitcoin uses an incredibly large amount of, of energy in order to do its work. Yeah, I saw the comparison. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's like 10 times as much as uh, Ethereum, and Ethereum is uh, like second to Bitcoin. <laughs> it's IOTA. That's why I keep saying IOTA is where it's going to be. I really think because it's a tangle. Yeah, Each trans know. yeah. some other transactions, and it they all somehow it all works together. It's a fascinating system. Yeah, man, I'm looking into uh, IOTA for a very long time already, and it's pretty yeah. good, man. Especially if you're uh, looking into uh, like energy stuff or uh, you know charging your vehicle, uh, yeah, things like that, IoT things. Then it's freaking amazing stuff it's really i find it fascinating that they're so fat they're so fixated on the internet of things yeah. the aspect of of applicability because i really see it as having use in the general crypto space um yeah um they're really looking into those uh i think is is gertzel uh not also uh working together with iota Really I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, they're they're working together with Bosch for a very long time already. And I know some people from Tesla also uh, cooperating or working at IOTA currently. So yeah. So uh, if Alec uh, uh, can make it work, eh, maybe uh, you can stream this public and you together can go through it or something yeah we could actually do i don't know if let's let me try to pull this up uh have you ever used live share in vs code no it allows no. a remote user to control your cursor in vs code I don't know if it would let him remotely drive it to the extent. I don't know if you can open files and stuff. Let me let me pull it up and see. Interesting. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to switch uh, platforms here. Am I coming through? Yeah. Yeah, I just rebooted and I cannot. Oh, yeah, I can see you. Yeah, I cannot share a screen or a window. <laughs> And I am trying, I was going to see if I could load up live share and I'm uh, getting this signing in, it's hanging at that point. 
Because with that, you might be able to step through the code in my, the editor on my machine, but controlling it from your side. If it would work. If it would work, I can't. I, usually, it's it's. I've used it a couple times, and it worked easily. And now this thing at the lo the logging in phase. Um, Alec, you could also try to go to the Jitsi and see if your screen will show up there. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking, <laughs> going over to inner space. Um, Jayla, could you set up something? Like what we do for a builder calls? Oh, okay. Well, we can see if it works. Okay. Yeah. I, right. Yeah. I I just can't stream anything. <laughs> Oh, okay. I was doing it wrong. Okay, I just posted a link in the dungeon walls. If anyone wants to connect to that and see if you can open a new window. Okay, I think I figured this out. Yep. There we go. <laughs> uh, it's the permissions issue. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> All right, we've got a decent turnout here, so let's get going. Um, sorry for the delay. This, I guess this is why you uh, practiced doing this before the time comes. Um, <clears throat> so, I guess, I guess first of all, um, can you guys just give me a little bit of background about kind of how experienced you are, like? Um, diving into this project, there's a lot of different technologies, and it's it's nice to kind of frame the conversation around, um, you know, how experienced people are with like React or Web three or you know backend programming, databases, that that sort of thing. Yeah, well, shall I kick off? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Oh. Yeah, um, well, I've done uh, quite a lot of programming, uh, but uh, the GraphQL uh, part is new for me, and uh, I'm not. I I know React. Uh, uh, I've worked uh, more with Vue, uh, Vue, Vue .js. Um but yeah, I know the concepts and I know how React works, um, and uh, yeah. Databases is uh, 
I'm, I'm comfortable working with uh, most uh, types. And I know the concept of GraphQL, but so, yeah. And uh, with Web3, I, uh, um, yeah, I'm like a beginner. I know how uh, okay. the library connected and set up uh, things like, uh, what is it, uh, Wallet Connect and things like that. But for example, I was now figuring out how to connect with the XDI network and integrate that. So, and there I really need to read up on this stuff. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll say this is the first project I've done that's like involved with Web3 stuff. So like integrating wallets and whatnot. Um, but I'm pretty familiar with uh, React. I've got like a comp side degree. So I'm pretty good with the front end designs and stuff like that. Um, and I know some databases and file systems. So it's not too hard to figure out the docs and sort of work it, work through that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, I can go real quick. I am I've been writing software for about 20 years now <laughs> and currently re working in React a lot and liking it. Um, I've got two major projects other than metagame going on. One is for Metafactory. They are producing virtual wearables that you can wear in VR to go to accompany their physical items and i'm helping them with to create the nft that will that they'll give to people in order to give them those virtual items and i'm also working on an overlay network on for a collaborative virtual file system using the ceramic network which is fascinating as well but getting very complicated and difficult to conceptualize mm -hmm. yeah that's me Sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. cool Uh, I guess I can go next. Uh, I've been working, I've been building software mostly with React for three years now. Um, I'm quite familiar with GraphQL and uh, Apollo, so um, that's actually the stuff we use in our, in my full time job right now. So uh, yeah, I, I'd say I'm pretty comfortable with that, and um, a little bit of a beginner in Web three, but um, sort of familiar. So yeah. Rob, I see you unmuted, but I can't hear you. No, still nothing. Hello? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Hello, guys. Um, yeah, I started uh, coding a year ago. Um, 
did like a boot camp and they kind of liked what I was doing. So they hired me. So I'm working there now as a tutor. Um, I'm most comfortable in React. Um, I know a bit of the backend stuff, have had a little bit of an insight into GraphQL, but not super familiar with it, to be honest. And I just started um, getting into Web3 and the Ethereum kind of ecosystem like some months ago and still very much at the beginning. So yeah, I'm curious about all of it. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll go last. Um, so the, the, the good news is that um, you don't really need to know any Web3 stuff to be super productive in this repository. Um, the, the vast majority of code that we're writing and things that we're building are wholly in the Web2 universe. Um, so yeah, don't don't be dis dissuaded by the by any lack of knowledge about you know smart contracts or or Ethereum blockchain or anything like that. Um, like speaking from experience, like I have almost no experience <laughs> building any Web Web three components, and you know I'm super productive with this repository, and I'm able to get a lot done. So, um, I I have a CS degree as well. I've uh, been developing for like 15 years now ish, um, and I've I've been an independent contractor professionally for almost that whole time. Um, which is required, like learning lots of new technologies and getting, you know, spinning up new things pretty quickly. And so I'm able to kind of jump into new projects and get things done quickly. Um, so yeah, metagame has been really fun. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm just excited to get more builders going on it because we have so much that we need to do. And I think the the building of Software is probably our biggest bottleneck right now. So uh, I appreciate everyone coming to this to this call. And uh, yeah, let's um, kind of get get you acquainted. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into the repository. Uh, I'm currently checked out the master branch now. Um, our GitHub repo, if you haven't been, is here. This is there's actually a few repos under the MetaFam organization. Um, this one is our source code instance, um, which is what we use for tracking XP and calculating the seed distributions. Um, I'm not gonna get into this unless we have a lot of interest because um, the, the bulk of the code is in our mono repo, which is this the game repo. Um, this is entirely TypeScript. Um, and the idea here is that we can uh, share code like in this utils package um, between the back end and front end um, and just just you know share configuration and deployment deployments and that sort of thing <clears throat> all in one place um so yeah typescript across the board um i won't get too much into typescript because i feel like you kind of have to figure it out just as you go um, we have fairly good tooling with our um ts config and linting um so i will say that we use yarn workspaces and lerna i believe under the hood to do our mono repo <laughs> um i don't know how much experience folks have with mono repos but um basically you have <clears throat> you can have within this repository like multiple npm packages um these two aren't really used uh, app react and types um but the you know the backend code is here the discord bot code is here and the web code is here and i single these three out because these are the ones that actually get packaged into docker containers and deployed um on the room and of course they're they're talking to each other in, in various ways um and yeah, at any point, feel free to ask questions or ask me to slow down or speed up. Um, I want to keep this engaging. Um, and then the other piece is Hasura. Um, and I, just a disclaimer, I knew nothing about Hasura before starting this project. Um, I actually haven't done a whole lot of GraphQL. Um, but from what I understand, it's a kind of a managed GraphQL 
server um, and it allows you to have a web console for interacting with your database. Um, so we use a, a Postgres database um, that Hasura pretty much manages um, and it provides um, functionality like migrations and uh, code generation and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, a, a lot of other stuff too. It's, I think we've kind of scratched the surface of, of what can be done with, with Hasura, um, but yeah. And I, I didn't actually set up any of this stuff. I believe mean, it was uh, MetaDreamer that, that set up the, the mono repo, and we're slowly kind of migrating some other code from other packages into here. Like one of the <clears throat> projects I've been working on lately is actually getting this Discord bot package up and running. Because um, we have another repo where um, there's a few, I don't know if you've, you've inter interacted with some of our custom metagame bot commands. There's like an XP command and, you know, set ETH address and a few kind of onboarding um, commands, mostly to interact with our source grid instance um, so that we know who you are and we can we can compute XP based on, you know, what you're doing in Discord or Discourse or GitHub, which are the three uh, main integrations with, with source grid. Um, and yeah, source cred is our way of programmatically and automatically kind of gauging value being added to the project. And you know, obviously, whenever these things are automated, they there are pros and cons. Um, the pros being like, if you're a builder, what you do in GitHub is tracked um, completely. And so when you're approving PRs, when you're pushing PRs, when you're commenting on issues, when you're creating issues, that all generates XP. Um, and XP eventually, you know, we mint seeds based on the, the XP that you generate. Um, and about a month ago, we actually bumped up um, the weights for GitHub contributions, um, mainly as a way of um, incentivizing more and more builders to join and, and contribute. And so uh, I will say that um, it's one of the highest impact ways of gaining seeds and to contribute to this project. So please like dive in and yeah, go for it. Um, and you will, you may be surprised at how well you get compensated. I, I certainly have, <laughs> and it's, it's been really fun at the same time. Um, any, let me just pause and any any questions so far about anything? Uh, I have a question. Sure. So you guys you guys use Web Tree, right? Yeah, we do. Um, uh, how how were you guys able to use that with the TypeScript? Um, because the last time I checked, I don't think. Uh, TypeScript, TypeScript had like the, the types didn't have support for WebTree. So, uh, what do you guys do? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, TypeScript is just a superset of JavaScript. So anything you can do in JavaScript, you know, just works in TypeScript. It's just a matter of you know how strict your TypeScript tooling is, um, and you don't you don't actually need types to use TypeScript, um, and so therefore, you know, and any of the you know native or uh, Web three libraries that run in JavaScript will work in our in our repo. Just maybe a matter of um, you know not using the types or you know disabling types for for your linting or or whatever. But uh, yeah, um, I can kind of point you to where that is on the front end. So basically, um, I think there's like a Web three context here, um, and we probably yeah we have like our custom type that we built to kind of, you know, this is probably a very tiny set of the types that whatever library we're using, um, yeah, what we'll, wallet connect uh, and some providers. But yeah, I, I think generally speaking, um, whenever I'm working with a JavaScript library that doesn't have types, um, I just kind of, you know, reference the API documentation to build what I need to build and then 
as I'm going, I add types either like in the same file or if it's an external library, you can actually add your types here. So you can see like um, just recently I added like a huge TypeScript definition file for source grid. <laughs> so I was playing around with their, with their APIs. And there's a nifty little tool put out by Microsoft called DTS Gen. Um, and you can basically point that at any um, JavaScript library that doesn't have types and it'll go through and kind of, you know, automatically generate some sort of like API surface. Um, and obviously it's not super useful, like having an any type <laughs> doesn't tell you a whole lot, but at least you kind of know what the API surface is. And it can kind of help you get, get a, acquainted with these uh, third party libraries. Okay, cool, cool, thanks. Yeah. So the, how do you uh, uh, take the data, data from uh, SourceGrid? Because uh, the ledger is in the repo, I think, and uh, uh, is that connected somewhere? Do you call it? Uh, Call the ledger somewhere, or how's it the? Uh... Yeah, let me um, let me open up the migrator file, which is kind of like the and, and and like which parts are in the database and which parts are uh, source grid. Yeah, so um, let's just start with the the players page here. Um, Pretty much everything here is in our database, except for actually XP is also, yeah. Everything you see in this page is in our database and um, anything attached to source cred is, there's this job that gets run on a daily basis that basically like accesses that um, source cred instance and pulls the XP information as well as um, aliases, I believe, and then populates or updates our database. And there's currently a bug where certain players were having some sort of collisions or something like Dispulic, for instance, <laughs> hasn't had his XP updated on, yeah. on the site and like two bugs is like say, way behind. Alex. <laughs> Real quick, um, on the that page, the profile images and the profile names are coming from three box. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Is that it? Yeah, that was it. Okay. Cool. Um, and we do um, tie like your login to a Web three address. Um, so. I, Probably need to authenticate with MetaMask here. Let's do that over here. Um, in, in order to uh, connect. And then once you're connected here, uh, you can set up your profile, which includes your username, your skills, basically you know everything you see on a, on a player card. Um, you can set up through the <clears throat> that interface. Let me actually just log in real quick. Oops. And obviously, like, um, you need an Ethereum address and some sort of Web3 like extension or something to interact with. Um, my meta. There you go. Yeah, we've done a quite a bit of work with um, this flow, the oh deer. Maybe it's broken.
yeah apparently that's not working so if anyone wants to create an issue or try it themselves that'd be awesome um so back to the code base um oh yeah so this um uh michelle asked about um updating this information from source code and this is a um job basically that gets run on a daily basis and it accesses that source code repo and pulls in the account information and basically calculates pulls in like the xp um as well as aliases and that sort of thing and, and just updates the, the information in, in our database Um, and there's some bugs with this that I just mentioned. <laughs> that's actually on the, the top of my to-do list because it's I feel like it's one of those things that's pretty obviously broken and annoying for people. Um, so yeah, stepping back a little bit. Um, so there's, yeah, there's three major packages. There's the backend. Um, which Hasura kind of, Hasura is our public, really our only public, public backend API surface. Um, and a lot of the calls are delegated to this backend instance. Um, let me just um, go into my terminal and uh, get the console running. Does anyone have experience with Hasura here? Nope. Oh, thanks. <laughs> XP for you. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, great. <laughs> um <laughs> um so yeah this is super helpful these are basically all of the commands that we provide um and like these bottom few you can say you can see we use um it's basically a way of like calling commands on each one of these internal packages um in a really simple way. Like let's say I want to build the web package. It's just yarn web build. Web, you know, referring to the, the web package. Um, and then there's a bunch of like this is how we start up our basically all the Docker and um containers except for the bot. Um I didn't add the, the Discord bot to our Docker container, because I don't know if it's even possible, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, to like interact with Discord from a locally running bot. Um, and besides, we uh, we deploy that separately anyway. It's a separate like Docker Docker file, which is here. Um, all of our backend services are deployed on render.com. Um, I think there's yeah the Postgres instance, uh, the back backend Hasura, and the Discord bot are all um, separate deployments. And the Discord bot and Hasura are publicly available, and the backend instance is just a Node.js um, server um, that's only visible to the the Docker containers within Render. You know, uh, going through the Docker network. So is how um, sure is it uh, on top of Postgres, of or is it just? Uh... Yeah, so Hasura is kind of how we manage our Postgres instance. And um, let me just fire up the console, and then I'll show you. So ninety six, ninety five. It's open here. Uh, 
yeah, there's there's a ton of stuff that's super helpful here. There's like a nice GraphQL Explorer where you can do like just click around to get the information you want. Like list all the guilds. Currently we only have one guild, or at least on my my instance, which is the Metafam guild. Um, whenever you want to change the schema, um, you can go into here and click into the table you're interested in and you know, it's this modify tab. And so anytime, like Michelle, for your, for your last PR, um, I added these to this GitHub URL and Twitter URL um, so that the guild page could reference it even though there's no data. And that was just a matter of like clicking in here, you know, Twitter URL, save. And then every time you save, it will actually generate a migration to, you know, that will be run automatically when the container starts on the production instance. So the schema uh, in uh, the code base, or was it the schema? Can you go to the code base for a second? Let's yeah, see. there is, it's in the metadata here. Um, so most of it is here. And this is, okay. it's, it's actually fairly readable. <laughs> Um, okay, so but yeah, schema for Postgres. For Postgres. Yeah, I mean, Hasura kind of abstracts it, and I think they have support for other databases. Um, but I think the best support is I, I think they they initially launched with only Postgres support, so so they have pretty good support for all the different data types. Okay. Out of the box. And, um, and the GraphQL. You, the GraphQL uh, folder in the web, for example, is it auto-generated or uh, do you alter any, like for example, the, these migrations that you just showed, are they, they, do you make a migration here in the code base? If you, because you just said you go to schema and then uh, you just add columns, but does that make a migration or do you make a migration in the code base and then run the migration and that adds uh, columns to the schema because that's uh, the normal produce uh, procedure I know that you create a migration file and then there I was going to say there is a command line interface where you create migrations but one of the biggest headaches that I have had with this project have been when changes are introduced into the migrations so Hasura won't load and you can't export that that metadata is exported from Hasura. So if Hasura won't start, you can't update your metadata. And if you can't update your metadata, you can't update the generated code. And it's just a couple times that has really just shut me down so far as work. <laughs> Having to deal with that. I don't know at version two. Version two is where they're doing all their big development now. And we're all in one three. I don't know whether or not that fixes some of that stuff or not. Yeah, that's a good point. I've had a lot of similar pain. Like one common thing that I do is, um, like I added those two columns through the console and it created separate migrations for both of them, but I wanted to kind of combine those into one migration because, you know, just to make it more concise. And so whenever you add the column, it, auto it immediately applies that migration to your local instance. Um, but then when I went through and like squashed them into one file, uh, which is probably this one, yeah. Um, if you try and run this migration locally, it'll blow up because you've already added these columns. <laughs> and so that's one kind of annoying thing. Okay, so both <laughs> these files are, are created automatically. Yes. Because you add um, stuff in the console of Asura. Right, but you can still, I mean, this is just Postgres um, SQL. So, you know, there's a, a bunch of times where I've actually uh, added my own migration directly to this. Like for instance, there's a, I believe there's a migration where we add like all the, yeah, it's this one. We actually add all the Discord ideas for our current guilds and, you know, and you can actually, actually, let me show you something else. Um, I think the way that I did this was going into there's there's some place to run. Yeah, it's right here. 
you can run raw SQL and then you can click this and then whatever you run will automatically generate, you know, a migration of this name. And so it's super handy to just do that. And then you can just edit the migration file, you know, later on if, if it turns out, you know, basically you can practice with your SQL here and then run it. And then once you feel good about it, you can just create a migration automatically. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of interesting things with this. Um, we have a few actions, um, which I actually haven't played a ton with, so I'm not going to get into it. Um, but the the most like tangible stuff is in this this uh, data section, and then of course just playing around with the um, GraphQL. Oh, and also. Um, once you change the schema, um, I believe you have to go to go and run this command, uh, update schema. And basically what this does is it pulls the GraphQL schema, the entire schema for the whole project, and then puts it into this file, which I believe is just in the root of this project, yeah. Um, and after that, you can do a yarn generate. Yeah, this guy, which will actually, um, it'll generate TypeScript from your schema for like basically CRUD operations on all of your data data structures, and, and this will do it for all you know, like learner run generate parallel, meaning it does it for all packages that have a generate command, which I think is the web and backend and probably the Discord bot too. So it's kind of a few steps for doing that, but once you have your TypeScript generated, then you can reference it in you know your React components or whatever. And uh, let's see, where is that? I think it's right here, GraphQL Autogen. This is this like enormous compilation of yeah. types, you know, a vast vast majority of which we are using. But you know, if you're just doing basic CRUD operations, you can just reference this and then create you know custom GraphQL uh, types or whatever you call them for 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 like very specific um, operations. So what of this in this folder is automatically generated, and what do you need to generate yourself or code? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, if you just look at what's what's ignored in Git, that stuff that's automatically generated, and everything else is hand coded. Mm -hmm. So there's like auto generated code in, I think it's in lib. Yeah, it's auto gen, and the way that they're generated is a bit different for like we have this DAO house SDK. I believe has sewer generated this as well, but it pointed to this like external repository. To, to, to generate it. Um what else? So there's this design system package. Um, and basically this takes Chakra UI and exports most of it, and then you know customizes the styling and stuff in a way that um, can be standardized across the app. Um, so you'll see in the, the web directory, um, I think we have like a, a context that applies those styles globally to everything within it. And basically it takes like the exported um, components and styling from Chakra and then allows you to use it. So when, generally speaking, you know, whenever you're building anything that could be a common component and um, try and put it in here um, so that we can use it elsewhere, not, not just in the web, directory but wherever else
Um, meta maps. Yeah, looks like that was removed. I can probably just delete that. And utils is really our only package that's shared across our other repos. Um, but yeah, it's just a bunch of utilities for all kinds of stuff. Um, any other questions? Anything specific you'd like me to dive into? Well, I have one uh, thing. In uh, the console in Azura, can you go there? Sure. Oh, that's to console. Okay. Yeah. And then if you go to, uh, uh, oh, yeah, I know it's here. On the left, you have the tables, views, functions. Yeah. Uh, so, because, yeah, there are, the, I saw the tables indeed, yeah. So, uh, uh, what uh, let's see uh, like when uh, like normally you know i'm used to having uh, tables and uh, mostly just you are using orm so when uh, are you making functions like uh, how does graphql uh, use them because i i noticed that there is uh, like for example um uh, well for a lot of things there are um uh, uh, f uh, uh, functions made. So, for example, the players in the guild. You know, you're not uh, fetching like the relation, or you f you fetch a guild and then a specific guild, and you then you fetch the players through the relation. But I noticed that here there is this function made specifically for that call. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, and uh, I'm probably actually not qualified to answer that. Um, I know that when Paco created the quest features, um, he added like specific actions for for all that stuff. Um, but like for the vast majority of um, queries to the back end, it's just you know GraphQL, which you know Hasser just understands. Um, and because all those you know GraphQL entities are auto generated. Um, it can handle most of what you need to do just with that, you know, default uh, GraphQL endpoint. <laughs> it's a bit strange because for me, I'm really used to uh, using like a relational database with an ORM, and now it's sort of, I get sort of the feeling that I got sort of like a, a NoSQL uh, type of uh, ORM on top of a uh, relational <laughs> database. It's, but yeah, that's uh, it's GraphQL. I don't know. What... Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, I, I don't have much experience with GraphQL myself. Um, and, you know, most of the time I'm kind of hand building REST endpoints um, in a way that's a little more like discoverable, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just like pattern matching what people have already done. <laughs> yeah, my god, it works. Okay, well, uh, I'll uh, figure it out then. <laughs> um, there's a few like gotchas um, that I'll get into. Like whenever you. I'll just give you an example. Like when I added these two URL columns, um, by default, um, we do not make these publicly accessible. Um, and so Hasura has pretty fine grained permissions for all aspects of our schema. Um, and so what we've done is created like a player role, which is basically if you've connected your web your Ethereum address, then you are a player. Um, and otherwise it's public and like only certain things we even allow uh, the public to select. And so you actually have to opt in um, anything that you want to show on the front end. So it's like, 
you know, I, I still do this all the time. I'll like add a column and then try and fetch it from the front end and then it won't work because I didn't actually go in here and click the, <laughs> the, the, you know, enable it to be publicly accessible. Um, all right, what else? Well, the ping of the guild that you showed, that's a view, right? So do you also have that for the table or is it like standard standard that you make like the guild table and then you make a, a view for that the table that uh, uh, has the guilds, shows the guilds, and then you can you have to set all these permissions. Is that like the standard flow for GraphQL or you don't know? Um, that I don't really know. Um, yeah, we're, I, I feel like we're kind of exploring it as we go. And I'm like, you know, more than happy to adopt some best practices with this. Um, like, like this project is still pretty young. And so there's, there's a lot we could do to kind of clean things up and, you know, learn from people with more experience. Um, but so far, you know, we just <laughs> try and lock it down as much as we can. <laughs> <clears throat> while making it usable but yeah that there's no like i don't know if you're talking about like a database view but, but yeah there's nothing like that um that i know of with with hasura i mean it, i guess you could think of hasura as like one like kind of dynamic view <laughs> that, that that presents like an interface to your database wow. Wow. okay interesting well uh... I'll see as I go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's these triggers also, um, which we haven't used a whole lot of, but like one, one example of this is um, a few months ago, I built the ability to like automatically update your role in Discord based on your role in my meta uh sorry not roll rank um so you know we've got seven diamonds seven platinums seven golds you know so on and so forth and before we had to go through discord and um change them you know every month or so just just uh just manually um so what i use hasura for was i created a trigger so whenever the rank column is updated on a player it will send an event to uh, some trigger that you define somewhere um, and then that triggers you know just some code to do whatever you want to do so in this instance um, we go and fetch the appropriate information from our discord instance and actually update a player's rank and remove any previous ranks at the same time and so yeah that kind of kind of things like baked in um it also has the ability to interact with remote schemas which is kind of interesting um like we i think we're using DAO house in this way in order to fetch um, guild information currently. Like I believe that is what generates the like the SDK for DAO house that we can then call um, yeah, DAO house client. And basically it like pulls in it the DAO house API to our own API and integrates it in a unified way. So even though it's you know we're not actually controlling that that API, we still have access to it um, and can like stitch together queries, I believe, between schemas, which is kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, what else? 
let's see. I talked about, oh yeah, our, our CI process. That's probably worth getting going into. Um, so whenever you do a push, um, oh yeah, the, the, the general process for um, contributing is to, you know, introduce yourself on the Builders Guild and Discord. Um, and put your GitHub account in there, and then we can add you to this repo um, because the way that we, it's, it's just easier to create branches within our repo um, because, oh yeah, the other part of the, the CI that I left out was the web, the front end server is deployed on Vercel. Um, and every time you push a PR, it will actually trigger a build in Vercel and it'll actually stand up like a separate web instance um, for that particular PR. So you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, and that only works if, I, I believe, yeah, I think that only works if you push a PR directly to our, to a branch on our repo rather than, you know, forking the entire repo into your own, you know, GitHub user and then doing a PR from there. Um, it's pretty handy to have that, you know, automatically deployed um, instance for, for like showing people or just kind of debugging what's going on. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I have. Um, if there's any more questions, like one, one question I have for you guys is like, you know, what, what can we do to make it easier to get started? Like whether that's a communication thing or just providing more resources or, you know, providing better tooling. Um, cause it's, it, it seems like we get a fair amount of interest, um, from builders, but like very few of them actually end up building anything. And I'm just curious, like what's, what's kind of broken in our process to make that better. Yeah, I think I'm the, most of the people here are either this music is pretty active, Julia is pretty active. The others aren't really started, I guess I'm guess the only one who already started lately. So for me, it's, uh, what I notice is that uh, I just uh, hop into quite some questions and things to figure out. And like, for example, yesterday, you know, I do the push and then I get some weird errors and yeah, this just, uh, so I think the nicest thing would be to just, uh, uh, or uh, probably just go into the builder's uh, channel more while working or something and then we can communicate a little bit more and people can hop in and ask questions because now if I have a question and I have to DM someone you or whatever it takes quite some time or well not sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't and things like that or we are sort of half discussing things on GitHub so Yep. Yeah, I mean that's like a <laughs> a pretty like universal like pain point for this project is that you know people are dispersed across all time zones and working at all, all different times of day. Um. So I I know Dispilic is pretty good when he's working on this project of just popping into the this 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 voice channel and just you know being available. Um, and I'm I'm happy to do that too. Uh, when I'm you know, in a spot where that's reasonable, <laughs> which is not always the case when I'm doing development. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be hopping in more as soon as I'm uh, coding stuff, and I'll try to be also more in here and to answer questions for other people. And then, so, yeah, that, uh, I think that will uh, help ev everyone out. Uh, we all do that as much as possible. Yeah. 
I uh, something I would like to raise again, and I've only I've talked about this a little bit in the Headhunters Guild, is the idea of not changing. Like I don't want to do away with XP at all, but I would like the idea of adding an immediate reward system to where for the given number of a given amount of time you say we will give you this amount of whatever right now what we do is you do some work and then you'll get some magical money in at some point in the future and i would yeah. like to put it in terms of not instead of but also like you know like 10 percent or something but like we'll give you 10 x die we'll give you a concrete cryptocurrency that you know you know what you can do with I had a guy who I told him I'll pay you 10 X die an hour or I'll pay you 20 X seed, which is that bridged seed. And he's like, I'll take the X die. And I was, I, that's what he took. Instead of the XP, you mean? Or no, instead of the, no, like 10%, like you get like not a ton of money. Like you get like $10 an hour or something. Yeah. And but for each hour that you put in, but that's only a small percentage of your total compensation. Like we're compensating it well over that now. But to, to, to move some of it, but not all of it. I just would like the idea of having the interfaces to support it. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, well, Oh yeah, well, well, one thing is, uh, I think is obviously what that's, uh, with all meta game, I think it's the frequency of uh, payments. So uh, it's sort of all uh, magical, as you say, magical money that you get on uh, somewhere in the future. <laughs> so and uh, but yeah, and for the hours you're working, um, yeah, that's that's pretty interesting to uh, to register that uh, in some kind of way and uh, turn it in some into yeah maybe some money you immediately get or yeah. something as you say and then uh some percentage later but yeah i have no idea yeah. how we could do that and because i assume we also want that to go through source cred so you could use source cred you could have it well it not really because source cred is the delayed action one what I would like to do, honestly, my ideal system is you have pair programmers and they record the session and they submit that recording. And that proves that they worked for that amount of time and you just automatically, the system automatically compensates them. If they have approval and they submit the video, then they get their crypto and there's not even any human interaction at all. Uh, that is right. Not even if you get paid them, but doing uh, pair programming sessions record the session uh and uh submit it somewhere with like a little bit of context like that's like huge because the next one if you you don't have to ask you can see oh he did it in that that time with that commit you go through the video you check it somewhere you know exactly what he did and that's also for yourself yeah. that's like freaking amazing if you can do this these kinds of payments would be great for the like the freelancing side of the platform or like the the labor market or whatever you want to call it but it's problematic to do it inside because like we would pay them instantly for that but then they would also get all the seeds from the xp you could reduce the github and you could maybe have it in source cred that it's already been compensated and reduce those commits and stuff in github like i think we could find a solution where a percent where you have percentages of both rather than either or Yeah, it sounds like, I don't know if anyone's hired people f through Upwork before, but they kind of already have that interface where, you know, the the, the workers uh, required to install the software on their computer, which, like, takes a screenshot every, like, X amount of minutes. Um, and then you can just, you know, bake into the bake into that system the, the crypto payments. It seems pretty straightforward. I'm kind of surprised that... I, I would be somewhat surprised if that doesn't already exist, but again, maybe, maybe Pete would know. Never heard of anything like it. Well, I, I, like I wouldn't really care much if I get paid immediately or something. But if you have like bi-weekly, uh, you are able to bi-weekly claim your seats and 
um, you have, for example, uh, the the creditor system. If that uh, starts working, then you can just put in, okay, did a session, two hours, then and then. Uh, you can register everything, how much hours you worked, and then it just converted to XP. And with the biweekly payment, then uh, for me, it's good. So long as XP is on mainnet, that's just not feasible. Another thing that this allows us to do is to back something with real value. Like this is actual labor value backing a currency on the XDI network. Right. I think that's the key point. Like uh, yeah. eventually moving to where we can mint on like a bi-weekly or a, or a weekly schedule. And like right now we were supposed to be minting monthly and even that like we, we putting didn't have like a concrete schedule i think that should be like the the first point to really like get okay if we're going to do it once a month then like it no, we know like every month it's in the same day like it just happens like it's regular rather than yeah, yeah. Right now, sometimes, it's yeah a month, sometimes it's a month and a half yeah, yeah and for the main net yeah i have no clue actually if uh that discussion, I think that's not a discussion that maybe even we should hold over here, but more like a source grid discussion. Like, are they uh, willing to uh, put in support for XDI or Polygon or whatever? So you can get rid of the gas uh, stuff. Yeah, it will be, will be pretty good. Yeah, the, I mean, the plan is definitely to move to layer two, like either to, either to XDI or Medic just probably not uh, until we move to the next phase so at least for like six more months and i see penguin is saying something but i can't hear anything does anybody else hear him nope i see the green circle but you're not hearing anything But yeah, we should have that uh, discussion soon, definitely. Yeah, it's and pretty. Stuff, yeah. yeah, it's pretty applicable to everyone. Um, and I feel like with the builders, like from my experience, like it's pretty easy to get XP <laughs> through GitHub. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I think like some of the other guilds where source cred isn't as like hooked in would be even more interested in this this whole way of, of being compensated even more, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the idea is to get people to do this like leap of faith, I guess. And, like yeah. if they're going to come here and experiment with this and yeah, just try it out and the people who won't like. Okay. There will yeah. always be people who will be like, okay, I would rather get paid a set amount in die. But like at this point, I think they're like the the target audience. Well, I'm interested in joining the source grad meetings. I'm, uh, uh... I was going to say. I just took a call with some um, contentful.com. Like I filled out, I, I created an app, uh, an account and did a sample application and some guy from their marketing team sent me a message and said, we'll give you a $30 Amazon gift card if you'll do a half hour interview with us. And I said, sure. Because it's just that I, I, I like, I think that our retention rates would be better is what I'm looking at. I also think it would be much better if we just uh, got more regular and like, I guess uh, we also have people who like um, A-smart. We never fixed, like he wasn't able to claim his seeds and nobody ever fixed that. And yeah, we were... Yeah. Like, <laughs> That's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good reason to abandon a project if you can't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely much room for improvement there. Yeah, way to good way to discourage the the new builders that just join us here. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of give my personal experience. So I, I joined MetaGame, you know, primarily interested in the mission. Like I wholly believe in it. Um, but then after like, it's been about six months. I think I've been working on this. It's like I've made a lot of like real money, and it's been like, you know, I'd probably, I'd personally, I'd probably be just as engaged if I hadn't made that money. But it certainly like keeps me more engaged <laughs> having that like tangible payments <laughs> you know even though it's magical internet money eventually if you try hard enough you can actually cash it out <laughs> it's it's cost you a couple of hundred to cash out but uh... right yeah and going up it's, it seems and uh, like yeah how like for the first two months when, yeah, I think you just joined when we had a huge delay when Hamad was moving to a new house. Did you get this girl at all? Yeah, that was about three months after I joined. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like I got um, onboarded reasonably well <laughs> before that happened. And then I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to do all this work too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just kind of keeping things running, you know. <laughs> which is fine, but I'm glad that he's at least wanting to come back. <laughs> Do we have any of the new builders that want to jump into something that haven't like picked up an issue already? Yeah, the the, the floor is open. Um, I mean, I need to go probably at 12.30 in eight minutes here, but I'm happy to answer questions or even do like some part programming if anyone's interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, is it possible to do like more check-ins like these? Because I think, I mean, it was it was really helpful for me just to see the, the sort of overview from someone that's already started to work on it for some time. Um, and it sort of made me more confident in, in starting to get work on this. So I'm not saying that I need the hand-holding, but, you know, it always helps to sort of bounce ideas off of other coders in the midst of things. Um, and and I might not have a question now, but you know, in the next one, if it happens sooner rather than later, um, in the time that I start working on something, I'll be able to get active feedback. Um, so yeah. All right, cool. Cool, thank you. So I have one, uh, one more thing. Do you guys have any idea how we could, uh, uh, like, can you, if if you do some pair programming, let's say, uh, uh, someone goes in, uh, I go in, and uh, for example, this beauty uh, comes join me, and I'm coding, and he's helping me, and uh, you know we do a session together, and I submit. Uh, uh, the code and make a pull request. Uh, can we register that we worked on it together and get the same XP? Yes, you put at paired with and then the name of the the username of who you paired with and source cred in the initial pull request request body, and source cred will pick that out and it'll split the XP. Okay, so that is a tag at paired with. Yeah. And then the username. Okay, amazing. It's in source creds docs. Mm. Yeah, it, this is so source cred will pick it up and it knows what to do with it. Yeah, well, um, I have no more questions. <laughs> Thank you, Alec, for uh, your time. Uh, 
this late uh, for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. No, it's it's early for me actually. <laughs> it's always it's like twelve thirty oh, in the afternoon. Oh, so. oh okay. Wait, wait for you, man. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, welcome. It was a big help. Is there any way to know like uh, the time zones of the builders here? Because uh, I'm I'm from the Philippines, so it's actually two in the morning here. So it, I guess it would be kind of helpful to know um, who which which time zones you guys are on. So I would know who to contact if ever. If you go to uh, I need my any help. Game WTF. Uh, I... Time zones are part of the profile that we store. Okay, cool. Thanks. For this, uh, it's maybe an idea to uh, for the guild part on Notion or something. We can make a table like for specific builders, so we don't have to search through the mm -hmm. my meta with the time behind everybody. Maybe mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah, that'd be a super useful filter, to add also. In my mind, now that we have that data. I'll see if I have access to uh, Notion. I don't know if I can edit. Uh, and I'll also I'll fix it with Pete. Uh, right, Pete? I can uh, add stuff. I, now I can make a table. I will get connection drop because I didn't hear any of that. Otherwise, I don't know if I have uh, uh, the rights to uh, write in Notion, but uh, I want to set up the table for uh, the guild uh, with all the names and time zones for just the builders. Okay, yeah, sounds good. So I'll, I'll check. I'll check if I can do it. Hey guys, yeah, thanks for coming. Okay. Uh, and let's, uh, Alex. let's talk soon. You're welcome. Thanks, Alec.